Okay, the purpose of vision is to see, look, which means that you have to move your eyes so you see, uh, and to maintain your visual attention on something. And we're going to call that fixation. It's something that is interesting to your visual system. You want to maintain your attention on it, and whether the object's moving, or you're moving, or you're moving and the object's moving, the brain has a built-in system for allowing you to lock on to a target and stay there no matter what's moving. Okay, and, and interpreting what you see is back here. Okay, that's, how, that's what got me interested in neuro-ophthalmology. I mean, the eyeball basically is a radar dish. All it does is take in information. It doesn't interpret anything. If you lose an eye, you don't lose any IQ. You don't lose any memory of anything. The eye is basically a radar dish. It's there to accept information. In, in humans, light. That's the stimulus. So that's all it does. It's just a receptor. Pretty complicated receptor, but nevertheless, that's all it does. It's a receptor. The rest of the visual system is in back of the eye and is outlined on this uh, slide. And you can see that the visual system spans the brain from the very front to the very back. So anything that occurs from the front to the back almost always involves vision, whether it's a tumor or a stroke or MS or head trauma or major infections. Visual, visual symptoms are very common. Okay, so this is looking at it from two views. On your left is a side view, on your right is a top view. And I think it just emphasizes the front to back representation of vision in the brain. Okay, we have five senses. Most of us would think that seeing and hearing are probably the most important senses of all. If you look at the optic nerve, each optic nerve contains 1.2 million fibers. Okay, so both together, 2.4. What's the next most important sense? Hearing. And yet, each ear has only 30,000 nerve fibers, both ears 600, 300,000, sorry. Two, uh, two ears, 60,000 nerve fibers, and so the ratio of nerve fibers to hearing fibers, 40 to 1. That's a lot. And I think it's safe to say that our purpose from the very beginning until now is sight. That's how important sight is. Um, and the visual system can be extensively injured, and yet there's so much overlap that some, I see a lot of patients, for instance, who don't realize they have loss of vision in one eye until they shave or put on their makeup or look through a camera where they have to close one eye. Because there's so much overlap between both eyes that if you lose one eye, you still retain a pretty good amount of vision. I think the best way to make an analogy is like your arms. I mean, my left arm can just about do anything my right arm does except for a little bit over here. And the same thing over here. So if you're blind in one eye, all you're really missing is a, is a 30 degree part of your vision, way out to the side. Okay, so we use the brain to see, and we use other parts of the brain to look, to move the eyes. And vision is reflex, which means there's a stimulus, there's a response. In the visual system, the stimulus is light. And so if light is perceived, and you want to fixate on that object, nerve fibers take it all the way back, and you can see right there in the center that they exchange information. As you go up the animal kingdom, there's more exchange of information than there is in lower forms of life. And so what that means is that each side of the brain receives information from both eyes. So the left side of the brain sees the right side of vision of each eye, each eye, and the right side of the brain sees the left side of vision of each eye. That's the redundancy. 
And the response is that you put together an image. So the eye catches the image, and the rest of the system moves the eyes into place so it can stay on the image. Now, think about this. If you, it's interesting if you don't think about it. If, you want to, if I'm standing still and I want to look at something, that's pretty easy for the brain to handle. But how about if I'm playing basketball and I want to keep my eye on the basket? My eyes have to move equal and opposite to head movement. So if I, if I want to keep my eye on the hook and I move my head to the right, my eyes move to the left. That's how I maintain fixation with head movement, with body movement. Now, how about this is a complicated phenomenon. How about if the target's moving and you're moving? I don't think Apple Computer could do a job on that. I think that's a pretty complicated set of directions. And it's instantaneous. And it's accurate. If I want to move my eyes 12 degrees to the right, boom. Both eyes move together, 12 degrees to the right, they lock on. Okay, so let's look at what we came to hear about tonight. As you know, the brain consists of gray matter and white matter. And you can see on the right side the optic nerve. That part of the optic nerve in the eye is referred to as the optic disc or the papilla. And the part of the nerve behind the eye is retro, retro meaning behind, retro bulbar, bulb means eyeball the part of the optic nerve behind the eyeball. This is what you see when you look in the eye. On your left is an illustration of the eye. On your right, you see the orange oval round optic disc. And to the side of the optic disc is the macula. The macula is where you have the greatest concentration of cells that are used for vision. So what happens with macula degeneration? You lose central vision. Central vision is what you use to see the clearest. If I want to look at the hook, that hook is landing right in the center of my vision. And everything out to the sides is relatively blurred. It's not as clear as the hook. So the nerve fibers that subserve central vision, most of them come from the macula. That's how important the macula is. Okay, diagrammatically, you have, you have this radar dish. Light comes in. It strikes the radar dish at a zillion points in the retina. And from those zillion points, nerve fibers course toward the optic nerve, and they head back to the brain. So you have these nerve fibers way out here that move to the brain. And if you look carefully, you can even see them these sort of striations. This is just a diagram. Okay, so this is really, I think this is beautiful. My wife wouldn't let me do this wallpaper. Uh, but this is, this is the visual system. I mean, there it is right there. Uh, if you look in a dog's eye, it looks the same, except it's green. Uh, I've never looked at another animal's eye, but I'm sure that every animal has an optic nerve that takes information from the eye back to the brain. Okay. The way they do it is that a cell catches light, hands it off to a nerve fiber, and the nerve fibers move to the optic disc and from the optic disc back to the brain. So it's a real relay station, <laughs> very efficient, very quick. Okay, the, these are actually the nerve fibers. You, you see the sort of gray striations that make that vessel a little obscure. Those are the nerve fibers coming from different parts of the retina toward the optic nerve. This is what it looks like in black and white. This is what it looks like when it's injured. Notice the difference. On your right side, you sort of have this sheen of nerve fibers. On your left side, there's nothing between the examiner's eye and the vessels. Sort of looks like a cartoon. Okay, the, the, the screen door that covers these vessels 
is taken away, and now all you're seeing are the vessels over here that are denuded of nerve fiber. So this is an important observation when you look in somebody's eye to try to get a feel for whether the nerve fiber layer is intact or not. Let's just talk about a few definitions. A symptom. A symptom is something that a patient complains about. I have an itch. I have a pain. I can't see well. Okay, that's a symptom. A sign is something that the examiner finds. Okay, it's something that the doctor finds or whoever's examining you, whether it be a doctor or a non-doctor. And as time goes on, it will be more non-doctors. Um, so, so a symptom is something that a patient complains about. A sign is something that a physician sees. We're going to talk about the definition of these things because you, you've heard them all thrown around when you go see your doctor. What's your visual field like? What's your visual acuity like? And so on. So let's just pin those down. Okay? This is looking out. And this is what the visual field is. How much you see right, left, up and down while you're staring at one object. So if, again, if I'm looking at that hook, my visual field is here, 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 and up. So it's how much you see. It's the expansive vision. And what's interesting is that this is what the right eye sees. Okay? And what I said to you before is very true. Because this is what the left eye sees. And there's a little area out to the side that only the right eye sees. And there's a little area out to the side that only the left eye sees. So if you take away the vision from one eye, you still have a pretty good amount of vision intact. You lose depth perception. You know, you may not be able to tell how far away something is uh, as well, but you can see. Okay, the visual acuity is what you always hear about when you go to the doctor, 20-20, 20-30. That visual acuity means what you see right down the barrel. The central two, three, four degrees of vision. In other words, if I want to look at something and I want to fixate on it and keep it, in, keep it in my vision, it's how clear it is. It's clarity. It's not expansive vision. It's clarity straight on. You've all sat down at this machine. Basically, this is a way of checking your visual field. You do one eye at a time and you push a button when you see the light. And depending upon the pattern of your vision, the examiner tries to say, gee, is it glaucoma? Is it optic nerve? Is it a stroke? Is it a tumor? Okay, you can, if a patient is reliable and the visual field machine is up to date, you can draw a lot of information from a visual field test. Color vision. Color vision is probably the most sensitive thing that you judge vision by. It's the first thing to go and the last thing to come back. If you have a tumor pressing on the optic nerve, the first thing to go is you don't see color as well in that eye as you do in the other eye. And you can have 20-20 vision. You can have a perfectly normal visual feel. And the only thing that's different is the vividness of color. Okay? So it's not as if this person is saying, that this top is green and this is red, they're saying that it's not as vivid, it's not as bright. That's a very sensitive indicator of optic nerve function. Now, this is referred to as the afferent pupil. Okay? If you go back and forth with the light, this eye dilates, this eye constricts. Dilate, okay? Constrict, dilate. That's a sign. That's a finding that the examiner looks for to validate a person's complaints. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people that walk away from a car accident saying they can't see from one eye. And you look for this afferent pupillary defect. If you don't see it, then you have to consider the possibility that the person is just faking it. Uh, and if you think that's not uncommon, come spend a week with me. And I don't know why, but there is a syndrome among teenagers. This is interesting. 
they're teenage girls. I don't know why, can't give you an explanation. Will often come in saying they can't see out of one eye. And, and they say, I'm seeing 2100. I'm not seeing 2020 like the other eye. And you prove that they're not faking it because they don't know they're doing it. Okay, they're doing, obviously doing it for some secondary gain. I'm not the right person to inquire about their secondary gain, but you can say, you can say that this is not true visual loss. Now, in the past few years, there was a great study published saying that a lot of teenage girls who come in with visual loss in one eye are the object of physical or emotional or sexual abuse at home. So, I, I, you know, that's, again, I can't inquire about that. I'm not trained to inquire about that. But I will, since I've read that study, ask the parents to be excused. And all I, all I can ask the child, is there anything you want to bring up? Anything you want to talk about? I, I surely can't step on that ground because I don't know enough to step on it. But I think that's a very interesting fact that, people take out their stress on vision. It's funny, years ago, in the turn of the century, people would come into a neurologist faking weakness on one side. Okay, so that's a pretty gross deficit. You can't move your right arm, you can't move your right leg. As time goes on, people have become more sophisticated. So there's the deficit that they, and I don't want to use the word fake, but I am, the deficit that they feign is not as gross as not being able to use your right arm and your right leg. They feign the fact that they can't see out of one eye. And, and, and you know darn well, for a teenage girl, there's no secondary gain. It's not as if she was in a car accident. Uh, they just develop this, this form of anxiety that they take out on their vision. So, the features of an optic neuropathy, you look at the visual field, you look at the visual acuity, you check color, and you look for that pupil deficit. Okay. Other things besides MS cause optic neuropathy. And so the, the, one of the questions that Laverne asked me to talk about was, what other things cause optic neuropathy, optic neuritis? A whole bunch of things can cause optic neuropathy. So you really have to be in a position of making sure none of these things apply, excuse me, before you say somebody has optic neuritis due to MS. When you see the word ITIS at the end of a word, that means inflammation. So neuritis is an inflammation of the optic nerve. Appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix. ITIS as a suffix. When you see the suffix P-A-T-H-Y, it just means there's a disorder. So neuropathy, a disorder of the nerve. Osteopathy, a disorder of bone. Optic neuropathy, a disorder of the optic nerve. MS optic neuritis is one kind of optic neuropathy. So these are the things someone should take into account when someone presents with the features of an optic neuropathy. Poor vision, change in visual feel, change in color, afferent pupil. That just says the person has a problem with the optic nerve. It doesn't say what it is, it just says where it is. Okay, let's talk a little about this. We said that this is called a papilla. So what's an inflammation of the papilla? Papillitis. And with papillitis, the optic nerve is swollen. And you can see the visual field shows a defect right in the center, just like we said. So they have a loss of central vision, a loss of color perception, a loss of visual acuity, and an abnormal pupil. You're going to hear these four things monotonously because they all point to optic neuropathy, something wrong with the optic nerve. Now, this is retrobulbar neuritis. The part of the optic nerve behind the eye is inflamed. So you look in the eye, 
and the optic nerves are perfectly normal. So the examiner shouldn't conclude that nothing is wrong with the patient because if they find a loss of color vision and a loss of visual field and an afferent pupillary defect, then you know the problem is in the optic nerve. It's just in the part of the optic nerve behind the eye. So nothing shows up in the eye. When somebody has retrobulbar neuritis or optic neuritis from MS, usually they'll say their vision went down, down, down over about a one to two weeks. Sometimes they have eye pain with it. And if the, if the retrobulbar portion of the optic nerve is involved, the eye pain hurts when they move the eye. So that's a common complaint. I don't see so well with one eye, and it hurts to move that eye. If by two weeks someone doesn't recover vision, you better, when I say you, I'm, I'm talking as if I'm talking to uh, residents and colleagues. If you don't see improvement within two weeks, consider other possibilities. And that's when you go searching for all the relatively uncommon causes of optic neuropathy. Very few people go blind. God, I've seen so many millions of patients with MS over this many years, I don't think I've seen one person who's blind from it. They may not see well, they may be really hampered and disabled, but they're not blind. And basically, I ask a patient to compare the color. If this is worth one eye at a time, if this is worth 100, cover that eye, what's that worth? So it's very subjective, but it's very sensitive. Okay, if you take all people with optic neuritis, this is before the days of MRI, no MRI, no spinal fluid exam, all people with optic neuritis, at the end of five years, 43% of them will have diagnosed MS. At the end of 10 years, 59%. And at the end of 14 years, two-thirds of them. So optic neuritis is a very common presenting manifestation of MS. Now that we have MRI, we can make, be more predictable right at the beginning. Okay, now let me just, this is an important slide, so I'm not gonna labor it. I just wanna tell you that if you have a normal MRI, the first go around, you have less likelihood of developing MS and if you do develop MS, you develop it the first 10 to 15 years. So if you have optic neuritis and you get past the 15th year, you only have a 2% chance of developing MS. So the first five, 10 years are really crucial in a person with optic neuritis. And obviously if the MRI is abnormal, the odds are greater that you will develop MS. Kids get MS too. Kids get optic neuritis. I see it all the time. They get it after measles, mumps, uh, any kind of viral infection. You see optic neuritis all the time. They obviously have a lower rate of going on to develop MS, but nevertheless, you still have to follow them. You want to be sure the diagnosis is accurate. How far do you go? Do you do an MRI? Do you do a spinal tap? Do you do blood work? Do you do this and do that? Acute treatment, basically intravenous methylprednisolone and Acthar. And then we're gonna talk about this called the clinically isolated syndrome. That's a person who comes in with optic neuritis, okay? They may have MS, but their MRI looks clean, their exam looks clean. What do you do with them? This is really a dilemma for doctors more than for patients, but uh, there are various schools of thought about how aggressive to be in somebody with a clinically isolated syndrome, especially since not all optic neuritis goes on to MS. So do you put that patient through A, B, C, D, E? I don't think so. The term differential diagnosis, it's a good term. What are the different things that cause a certain diagnosis? Differential diagnosis of Optic neuropathy includes all these things. That doesn't mean you look for all these things off the bat. You don't. Uh, but you have to keep them in the differential diagnosis if somebody's vision doesn't get better in a couple of weeks or if they have other symptoms that point away from MS. 
Okay, how about this? Lady comes in, she tells it like it is. Can't see, my color's off, my eye doesn't hurt. And she has this monotonous things we talked about before. Loss of vision, loss of color perception, abnormal visual feel, abnormal pupil. You look in her eye, and this is what you see, a swollen optic nerve. This, is what I, this case is a good case for me because this is what I learned doing a little more than a neurology residency, that sometimes you've got to dilate the eye to really see all the details. And this is a perfect example. I'll show you in a second. Okay, so you think with this instrument, which all of you have seen, that's all you see. That's the only thing you can see in the eye, is just the optic disc, nothing else. So with this instrument, that's all you see. If you dilate the eye, you see a little more. But then there's something called an indirect ophthalmoscope. Okay, where well, you really see the whole kit and caboodle. You see the whole retina. And sometimes that's very important. Why is it important? Because when you look at the entire retina in this patient, you see this star-shaped figure here. That is not optic neuritis of MS. Unequivocally, don't look for MS. You need to look for other causes. And the only way that you really pick up on that is if you see the macula. And it's very hard to see the macula with just a direct ophthalmoscope. And that's a lesson learned. Uh, I, believe me, I've been stung my share of times. You don't dilate the eye, it comes back to bite you. Eventually, what it was determined was this was a kid, and she had cat scratch optic neuritis. She had a cat, she had kittens. The kitten has fleas, and every, a lot of cats, and a lot of kittens have fleas, and a lot of people in the audience probably have cats and kittens and fleas. Why somebody comes down with cat scratch optic neuritis, I can't tell you. But it's very common in young kids who play with kittens. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get a cat or have kittens. <laughs> okay, the MRI is an important tool, but it has to be ordered in a customized way. You can't just shotgun a patient with an MRI. For instance, this is an MRI of the brain. The person was slowly losing vision in one eye. It was diagnosed as chronic optic neuritis. As soon as you see that, that's a red flag. You better look for something else. They were steadily, progressively losing vision. We said with optic neuritis, you lose vision over a week, 10 days, tops. So this was steady, week, 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 week. And the MRI was of the brain. So it looked at the whole brain which to me is sort of like looking at Atlanta and seeing 285. <laughs> okay, you see the whole city. I don't care about 285. I care about exit seven. That's what I want to see. I want to see the optic nerve front to back, top to bottom. And in this case, when you do that, the person had a slight tumor, a benign tumor right here, pressing on the optic nerve, causing the chronic optic neuritis, okay? That's important. So this is MRI 285, this is MRI exit 12. There's a difference. The MRI is a nice test. One of the questions Laverne asked me was to discuss MRI. MRI is amazing, I mean, I don't, just amazing. Because first of all, you see the anatomy sideways, from top to bottom, front to back. And you can see how beautifully it really shows the optic nerve here, here, and here. And in this case, if you use the proper technique, this is retrobulbar neuritis, that bright area right there. Okay, how do you treat optic neuritis? I'm sure that some of you in the audience could give this lecture better than I can. Uh, you use steroids. They work the best. Optic neuritis, neuritis is an inflammation. Steroids are the most potent anti-inflammatory drug we have. What you want to stay away from is oral prednisone. Never take it by mouth as the only therapy. Never take it by mouth as the only therapy. 
So you use either intravenous medication or you use medication that's given to the shot. And this is a relatively, it's an old medication with newfound uses. So when do you use it? If somebody can't take steroids, I, don't, I mean, a lot of people go wacky from steroids, or they can't sleep, or their diabetes gets thrown out of whack, or their blood pressure skyrockets. If they don't do well, not everybody obviously responds to intravenous methylprednisolone. You don't keep giving, giving, and giving it. You give it, you see if there's a response. If it doesn't work, you resort to a different preparation. If you can't get in somebody's vein, that happens. There are some people you can't get in their vein. And the Actar is something that you can give yourself at home. It's a, it's a user-friendly way of giving yourself an injection instead of somebody coming to your house and giving you intravenous medication. Okay. So we covered a lot of turf.